you know, people always say, well, most investors are engineers. And I think the, uh, the average person says, well, because they're good at numbers. And like, yeah, I guess we are, but you know, investing is not rocket science. This is a story about a dude named Lane. Then one day he went and tried to rent them out. And then he became one real investor man. I think engineers, the reason why there's so many engineers in investing is because we don't make as much money. There's that pain point in there. And we, but we make just as much money to like sort of buy at first property, right? We're not broke mm -hmm. two at the same time. Um, maybe kind of speak to a little bit about like, you know, doctors, you, you make so much money. So for a lot of, you know, your peers, the motivation is just, isn't there, right? Or is there? Well, you know, so, so it's interesting because I, I, I kind of consider myself an engineer too. I was, I was a biomedical engineer, even though I didn't pursue that as a, as a career path, but I did get some of that training. I, you know, I think well, I'll say this for physicians, there is a wide spectrum. So kind of, I would say a misconception out there is that physicians are very wealthy. And I say misconception, not to complain, not to say that, that you know, we're poor or anything like that. But by the time physicians go through all of their training, they're delayed, you know, 12, 15 years before they start, in, start earning a reasonable income. All through residency, you're working, you know, 80 plus hours a week and you're making you know, 40, 50 K when I think when I, when I was doing residency, it was like, I started at like, you know, 35, 36,000 working 80, you know, hours a week. So by the time you get through all of that, you're delayed entering, you know, the, the real earning market. Um, and in the last decade or so, the price of your education has gone on significant, has gone up significantly. So physicians are graduating from their medical school residency, delaying paying off all those loans, and they're, they've got $250,000, $400,000 in loans that they're in the hole with, that they've got to figure out how they're going to pay, pay that off. So, you know, it, it's not as, as rosy of a financial situation, you know, unless they're some kind of outlier where they're really in a high paying specialty or they for some, somehow have figured out a way to get through and not have all of that debt. I mean, there was a recent um, story in the Wall Street Journal, Journal. It was, I believe, an orthodontist who had over a million dollars in student loans. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of crazy. So unfortunately, the reality is that um, physicians are not in that great of a boat financially. Um, but um, I, I think we all can appreciate, you know, that, you know, being good with our money, saving up uh, a decent sort of, uh, you know, amount of money to start off with for, for investing purposes, we can start making some headway with, uh, with real estate. So what do you tell people when they're like, well, I'm, I'm gotta, I gotta pay off this $300,000 student loan before you even start investing, which how do you, I'm sure you've kind of dealt with this question a lot more than myself. But you know, you know, you know, it's tough. And I've actually had, I've had experts come onto my podcast because I didn't even realize how complicated it was. So to give you a little bit about my background, I got into medical school and I didn't know what specialty I was going to choose. Anesthesiology happens to be one of the better paying specialties. But at that time, I didn't know if I wanted to be a pediatrician, which unfortunately gets paid significantly less. And I didn't want money to make my choice of specialty for me. I wanted to choose something because I felt like I liked the specialty. I could contribute there and have a, a good, meaningful career. Um, so I took a Navy scholarship. The Navy paid for three years of my medical school. And in exchange, I gave them, you know, three years of active duty um, back as a physician. So I did that. So I didn't have all that crazy student loan debt. I paid for it in with time. So, so I paid th about three, three and a half years after I was done with all my training. I was a Navy physician with the U S Navy. Great, you know, great experience, less pay, <laughs> less pay when you're a military physician, but, but great experience and, and being able to give back, you know, to service people and, and, and our country. Um, but I didn't realize how bad this situation was until I had uh, an expert come, come on in who deals just with this. And it's so complicated with respect to um, the different payment models, whether you go and work for an underserved hospital um, where they, they can start paying, you know, they start paying for some of your, 
your loans after you give, say, 10 years of service. It, it, you really have to sit down with a spreadsheet and run the numbers. Um, so that's, that's how complicated it is, um, unfortunately, for, for physicians and other health professionals in, in these ballooning uh, student loans. Yeah. So, so when guys are going through residency and they have that pain component financially, mm -hmm. or, or, did you see anybody interested in this stuff? Because certainly it's harder after, right, when you're, when you're getting paid the big bucks. You know, it, it is, you know, the truth is that probably for most people during residency, residency is so intense that you don't really have time to think about this stuff, maybe with the exception of, of a few outliers. Um, for me, it was really towards the end of my residency when I could see that, that larger paycheck, you know, kind of on the horizon that I realized that I didn't know very much about money and I needed to start educating myself. So unfortunately, a lot of physicians fall prey to people who just sell them bad financial advice because we're seen kind of as a paycheck. Um, and, and there's a lot of education going on now there, there's, um, where they're, they're trying to, to teach physicians to have um, you know, better control of their finances and also trying to teach physicians the mindset of, hey, you've, you've gone through all of your training, you're a brand new attending with that bigger paycheck. You need to live like a resident for the next couple of years to set yourself on the right track. Because what happens is you've gone through, you know, 12, 15 years of delayed gratification. And now you say to yourself, I want that big, nice house. I want that shiny new car. And the truth is you can't, if you, if you buy all of those things immediately, you're, you're just going to dig a deeper hole. Um, so, so there's a lot of education that's going on now to try and teach physicians um, that they really need to practice these money skills because the sad part is that, that many of us still don't have them. Right. Cool. So, so um, I'm kind of interested, what is your simple passive cash flow number that you're kind of shooting for? What's that passive monthly goal that you're, that, that once you get there, maybe stop acting as frantically as you are feverishly working today? <laughs> 